Welcome to today's online painting class. I'm Ryan and we're going to start with a one inch flat headed brush. We'll dip the bottom third in some water to ensure that our paint doesn't dry too quickly and we'll also wipe off the excess so that our paint doesn't become too thin. From there, I am jumping into my palette, grabbing quite a bit of titanium white, about half that cerulean blue, and then just a hint, of Mars Black to desaturate that pigment. From there we do brighten it back up with some additional titanium white, and then we're off to the actual canvas where we are beginning in the background. And I generally like to start in the background because it makes my life significantly easier later on. We don't have to paint it around these meticulously crafted subjects in the middle ground or foreground. Instead, we can essentially just layer them on top of the background and save ourselves, again, just a lot of time. With that, I think it's also worth noting that while I'm painting the sky, I am lightly moving on top of my branches, my foliage. I am having that overlap and I'm not too worried about the drawing. We can go back and reincorporate it. And it's also going to ensure that later on, I don't accidentally kind of have this white space in between all of my subjects. So with that, I'm also applying a lot of this paint here initially with vertical strokes, diagonal strokes, and that is going to leave some varying brush strokes in the canvas but I'm doing so very quickly. So at the end of this, I can move into a horizontal stroke, which you can see right here, soften everything, unify it, and just ensure that we have a very cohesive look. That said, once I have two layers on there, I'm going to clean that brush and we're going to move on to step number two. For step number two, we are going to grab our Filbert brush. This one is about a third of an inch. Then we're going to hop into our palette and grab quite a bit of our green gold, a hint of our titanium white, a little bit of our Mars black, and then also some of our cadmium yellow deep hue. The yellow is intended to warm up the pigment as there is going to be a lot of sun on our greens. Our titanium white and Mars black are going to create a gray, desaturate it, and ensure that this backing color isn't too vibrant. From there, I am starting to test on the actual reference photo. This is how I ensure that my colors are as correct as they can be. I realize I want it to be a little bit warmer, a little bit brighter, so I work that back in, and I'm really trying to find a middle of the road green here, something that isn't the brightest, but also isn't the darkest. That way I can add highlights on top of it and I can also interject some shadows into it as well. That said, if you'd also like to work with the reference photo or even the traceable, I will have both of those up over on Patreon. They do help with the drawing process and the color matching process as you can see right there. But with that noted, here I am working along the edge of my tree line and I'm using the brush in a couple of different ways. Here we're using the sharp edge to create some actual individual little leaves, pieces of foliage, but then I'm also using the body to cover significantly more canvas in the areas that I don't need to be all that detailed. I'm also now going back in and very carefully crafting all of these different little pieces of foliage. They're kind of moving to the left, to the right, all of these different directions, and they get smaller as I move down the tree line, and that's because I want to already start instigating depth and perspective. If we make our leaves, our foliage larger at that top area, that area that's closest to us, we can make it feel like it is closer to us. And as we move farther back in that tree line, we make them smaller so that it looks like they're farther away. Now, this is very much the base layer. We have to do a lot to it, and we will add a lot of much more refined layers, but we're getting those ideas implemented. That way we don't forget later, and in the very least subconsciously, it will help in the painting process. That said, here we are now moving more so into the body of the area, and it's quite large. So I'm using that, you know, just larger area of the brush to do that. I'm also going to start darkening the pigment slightly with Mars Black as we move towards the right here because the tree line that touches the sky, that's going to be receiving more light. And then as you move closer to the right hand side of the canvas and even farther down in the tree line, that's where more shadows are cast from the trees themselves. And so it's going to get a little bit darker. Not going to make it a lot darker. This is still the base layer. I want to do things in a very subtle manner. We're going to be building on this in a number of ways. But right now, we just want a little bit of texture with our brush stroke. We just want that green 
screen to show through so when we're painting later we don't have that white of the canvas showing through and it's just a really nice easy way to jump into the painting process. That said, as you can see I am now speeding up the footage a little bit. I will do this with very repetitive sections and I figured you probably didn't want to see me paint the exact same thing in the exact same way for 25 minutes. So with that I am going to finish off this layer, let it dry, and we can jump into step number three. For step three, we're going to ensure that our layer is completely dry and we'll grab a half inch flat headed brush here. I have two different options, but I'm going to go with the more disheveled one to the right. And with that, I am heading back to my palette, grabbing quite a bit of a green gold, about an equal mixture of our Mars black and some titanium white. Here, our goal is to mix more of a darker value for our shadows. And this is something that's going to go through a couple of different iterations. Now, I'm I'm also grabbing some cerulean blue to cool it down. I do want my shadows to be a bit cooler than the mid values and the highlights. And I almost immediately realize on testing in my reference photo that this color is just not as dark as it needs to be. So I work in some of my Mars black back into that mixture, a little bit of that green gold, titanium white, really just trying to take it slow. But yet again, I realize it's not dark enough. So we add in additional Mars black and this is actually what I ended up wanting it to be. So now I'm heading into the canvas and I'm starting at the baseline of the trees where we are tapping in just a myriad of these dark little specks, essentially openings in the trees that you know will have these darker shadows. And we want to begin at the bottom because this area is going to have more shadows than really any other area of the trees, right? We have all of this foliage casting shadows down and that light just can't penetrate this area to that same extent. So I'm starting down in this area right here. I'm rotating the brush as I continue this process because I do want these applications to look different every time. And then as we move upwards, you can see that the paint starts to run out. It dissipates. We get something that looks a little bit lighter and that's fantastic because it makes it look like the light is working its way down and it's eventually losing out to the shadows. That said, I'm also going to create some very specific darker areas that will either have a protruding foliage that has, you know, just a more distinct contrast and therefore darker value or openings in the trees where, you know, you just really can't see the light in the heart of the forest. So there's an even greater shadow. We're going to be very selective with that. I am picking it based off of the actual reference photo, but we'll talk about that more in a second. That said, I'm also going to be doing a lot of this lesson, you know, close up, but also far away. I want to give you those close up shots so you can see how the details are actually being rendered, but I also want to do those far away shots so you can see what it'll actually look like in a room. And I think finding that balance is so important. Here we are speeding up a little bit of the footage because again, it's another process that does take like 15 to 20 minutes and it's quite repetitive. So here I just wanted to note that I am going over the bottom area a couple of times, really filling out those shadows in the top areas I'm leaving to be more sparse. Here I I am going to look at the reference photo though and just make a couple of these areas like at the top here a bit darker a bit more distinct so we do have some variance and we can start working on our highlights. We're going to begin step number four here by taking a brand new color, that being burnt umber, and adding that to our palette, though we don't need too, too much for this next portion. With that, I have my filbert brush here, and I'm grabbing about an equal mixture of burnt umber and Mars black with just a hint of a titanium white, and this is going to give us a fairly muted organic brown, which would be fantastic for distant trees. That said, here we have a small pointed brush. It's essentially a liner brush. At this point, it was a round pointed brush, but I just cut off the edges so I could have this very sharp refined point for very detail oriented areas like what you're about to see. So with that, the brush is quite damp because I do want all of those bristles to condense and that's going to allow me to drag my paint a bit farther than I normally would have been able to. It is worth noting that it's going to be significantly more thin because of the added water on the brush, but that's okay because we can always go back and work in additional layers to thicken that pigment. And also, 
When I'm doing these applications for these branches, I'm really trying to get them as small as I possibly can. When I have a branch that I really like that I feel like will be a bit closer to us, then I'll go back post it drying and I will thicken it. But it's much easier to make these things larger than it is to make them smaller. So I like to begin with the smallest application possible and then I build off of that. I'm also creating just dozens of these very small little branches. They kind of work off each other and I'm always trying to change it, ensure that it's consistently changing and you know, getting something truly diverse so that it actually looks organic. I think one of the biggest mistakes a lot of beginners make when rendering branches, trees, all of that, is just making it look too visually same. You're kind of relying on the same movements, the same break off points, and you do want to, you know, really get creative with it. That said, here I am starting to expand a lot of these. We're making it farther, but they are eventually going to get lost behind a lot of the foliage. The goal is really to have these branches come out of varying areas of foliage and then with our highlights cover them up in other areas as well. That way it looks like they exist within the trees. It's not something that's in front of all of the trees. It's not something that's behind all of the trees. There's a good mix back and forth and that's going to give us a lot of extra depth in this area. I'm also now going to start working on some trees off to the right hand side here and I am speeding this up because this is a bit of a timely process. A lot of this will be. There's quite a bit of repetition but the repetition is great because it means you have a chance to really practice, refine, and get these skills down, right? Here we are also moving into the distance. I'm trying to make these applications even smaller because they're far away, much like our foliage initially at the top, like what we were talking about with the greens. So those rules still work here. And now I'm also going to create some smaller highlighted branches for what we have in the foreground. It's more so of a bush. And we are going to kind of play with the brightness levels, the contrast of our branches, but this is closer to us. We can see more of its natural innate coloring, and it's also going to be a bit more in the light. This is protruding. It's going to be farther out from a lot of those trees, thus avoiding a lot of those shadows. And so we will get some extra highlights, which is why we're going in with this. I'm also doing a little bit of a tapping motion in there to get some texture in the wood. I'm not kind of trying to create a single fairly curved, perfect line. I want intricacies that make it significantly more interesting. And, you know, those imperfections in our brush stroke will generally get us there. Once all of our branches are dry, we are going to pick up a fan brush for the first time in this lesson. And with this, we're going to render a lot of detail and highlights for our foliage. With that, I'm going to start with quite a lot of our green gold, about half that with titanium white. And then I'll also grab some of our cadmium yellow deep hue to make it a little bit warmer. That said, I don't want it to be hyper saturated still. So I'm going to add in just a hint of Mars black and mix that up. I'm now testing it more so in the middle of our foliage and I like that a lot for an area that's receiving light but also might be getting a little bit of a shadow. It isn't the brightest area but it's still brighter than anything we've worked with. From there I mix up a second mixture off to the side, make this one a little bit brighter and that is going to be perfect for the outskirts of our trees that are receiving the most amount of light. That said, mixing with the fan brush isn't the most efficient thing, so I'm actually going to do a lot of the mixing here with our filbert brush, get a lot of that pigment ready on our palette, and then after that I'll go back to the fan brush and we'll kind of work back and forth in that manner. That way we <laughs> don't really a, hinder the bristles of the fan brush, but also save some time. Here you can see that we do have a lot of thick paint to the point where there's actually some texture there on the palette. I'm quite happy with it. And now I'm going to really get the tips of the fan brush ready. I'm going to tap this onto the canvas in areas that I feel there should be a lot of foliage. I'm starting in the top right above that heavy area of contrast that we rendered earlier. And much like with the flat headed brush, I'm trying to rotate this so that I continuously get these different applications, but with each little tap, 
you do get just so many great unique little markings that are going to shape your trees. I'm essentially trying to find the tops of trees within these larger clusters. I do these essentially rounded taps that you know I kind of move my hand for and that makes it look like this light is wrapping its way on top of these trees and you know creating a little bit of a gradient downwards I'm also going to fill out a lot more of the back with this highlight because I want it to be a bit more open the lights getting to it more so and you know I'll progressively introduce that contrast as we move into the foreground it's also worth noting that because of reflective atmospheric light generally the foreground will be more of a heavily saturated area something that has more contrast because optically a lot of the colors and the lights and the darts kind of visually blend in the background so that's also something i'm trying to consider in the background i'm letting a lot of those lights kind of clump together to a point i still want separation i still want to see those shadows in between but we'll definitely use less in the foreground to ensure that we can still have quite a bit of contrast and see individual leaves so with that, here you can see that I am still letting the paint dissipate on my brush. It eventually starts to run out, and that's nice because it gives you a wider range of values. You might assume, you know, we were using one color, how are we getting multiple values out of it? Acrylics are inherently semi-transparent, so as they run out, the more you see the base layer through them, and because of our base layer is darker, as they run out, you essentially get darker applications, which can really look quite nice, especially when you are applying the more thick paint to the true edge of the tree that's capturing the most amount of light, and then as you move down it, you start to lose that light, you start to lose pigment, you get something that's a bit darker, and you know, something that just naturally works. Here's a great example of that, actually. Here we're also, you know, just kind of creating different clusters, different shapes, and I don't want to do the same thing twice. That's something that I really, really want to stress throughout this process. Do try to continuously innovate with these, make different shapes, add highlights with different movements, different angles, different trajectories. And if you're really struggling again, just look at the reference photo. I think it's generally pretty notable and noticeable <laughs> which areas do have the added highlights and kind of how light will wrap its way around your subject. Here I am adding a lot to the top because this is really protruding. It's much more so, you know, out of the way. It isn't getting all of the shadow from those lower trees. And so it, much like the back, can also have quite a bit of highlight. I'm also not mixing to the brightest highlight and this more mid highlight at the same time. When we look at the palette, you can see both. And that's just because I know that one will dry on the palette before I really get a chance to use it. So I'm focusing on the lesser of the bright pigments and then, you know, we can brighten it a little bit later on. But I just wanted to establish what each of them would be initially so that I would know that they do look good together and we could kind of continue with a lot of faith in the process. Here I'm also going back and just adding a couple stray random pieces of foliage that are protruding. That way it does look a little bit more natural. Now here I'm heading down to the bottom bushes and I'm applying this and then I'm doing a little bit of a drag down to the bottom left. This is something that I sped up because A, it's a little bit repetitive, but B, because I ended up redoing it later in the lesson with a much better technique. I think that what I just did works, it looks fine, but it could honestly look a lot better and I'll show you how to make it look significantly better a little bit later in the lesson using a different brush and technique. We'll just, we'll make it look more original, we'll make it stand out, we'll give it more detail and we'll talk about all of that again just a little bit later in the lesson. Here though I am mixing up that brighter pigment that matches with the bottom one right and now I can head back in to the tops of our trees and build those highlights even more so than before. So we're just adding layers of depth, right? The more variation and values that you interject into your piece, the more light feels like it's moving around these subjects, the more natural it feels. And so this is something that you could really continue to do through a myriad of steps and applications provided each time you add a new layer, it isn't dramatically different from the one underneath it. So you want to kind of work in lower amounts 
and build through that. That said, here yet again, quite repetitive, so I am speeding up the footage, but it's such a cathartic process. I love adding all of these little pieces in this way, and it's fun to do so with multiple brushes. You know, we've now used three different brushes to achieve this texture, and I think it's coming together really beautifully. So once we fully establish the highlights on the foliage and let that dry, we are actually going to jump back into our palette and create a darker mixture of our previously applied branches. And this is going to have still a little bit of titanium white, but we want it to be darker. We want it to be nice and earthy, perhaps slightly more saturated because this is going to be for the branches that are a bit closer to us. This is going to create some depth within that specific subject. And again, how do we create that depth? We can wrap light around our subjects or we can create multiple layers of it varying in values and saturation because the layers that are farther away have generally a less saturated look, less contrast, the ones closest to us, more saturation, more contrast. So these are thicker because they're closer to us, we're working with perspective, and they're more saturated with a little bit of additional contrast. We're not going over all of the pre-established branches, we're just doing the ones that we feel could really pop and get out to us, and once I'm fairly happy and confident with those, I'm also going to move some branches on top of some of our newly applied highlights. That way, we do again feel like they're really moving throughout the piece and not just kind of in the center of all of these trees, because they will protrude. After that, I do throw some into the shadow areas that don't have a lot of detail and just balance it all out. But that right there, I am very happy with. So for our next step, we're actually going to hop on over to the left-hand side of the canvas and start crafting a brand new base layer for our foliage. However, this time we are working with a subject or rather set of subjects that are a lot closer to us. So we are going to increase that contrast. Our darks are going to get darker and this base layer is going to be significantly more dark than the base layer for our previously applied cluster of trees. That said, it's still going to be quite green. We still do have some titanium white in there and I am applying it with that filber brush that we initially used because we do essentially have this three brush system to build all of the correct textures throughout our trees. We start with this one and then we work in the flat headed brush and then we work with the fan brush. So here I am beginning with this and I'm also creating some offshoots of additional little pieces of foliage up here in the paint. I'm trying to be fairly loose with my brush stroke as you can tell I'm doing a lot of rotating I'm moving my hand my arm my wrist a lot but I am trying to get relatively clean lines with these applications because we are working on foliage that is very close to us we will see all of those individual little leaves and their motions so here I am trying to ensure that when I'm going into this I'm <laughs> kind of committing to getting the general shapes right. Of course, you can go in and redraw it if you covered it up with your sky. Um, again, the traceable is up over on Patreon, link in the description. But here I'm actually doing a, quite a bit of freehanding because I am fairly used to painting foliage in this manner. And you will see up close here that it looks a little bit rough in the initial layers. You can see a bit of that tooth from the canvas showing through and a bit of that grit. That is something we do work through, but that's generally something that occurs when you don't have enough paint to cover an area properly. It just kind of runs itself on the top of the canvas touching the top portions of the canvas, but there are so many little divots that it doesn't fill up unless you pre-gesso your canvas a couple of times, which isn't something I like to do. I like to let the, uh, the paint sink in a little bit more than that. That said, here I do go over a lot of those edges a number of times to fix that potential issue. And again, not everybody will have it. It's wholly dependent on the amount of paint you want to incorporate at that time. But again, through this lesson, we'll do a lot of close-up shots so you can see the details like this but we'll also do the farther shots so you can see what it looks like in a room something I mentioned before earlier but I did want to bring it up again because it should act as a friendly reminder to you that when you're painting 
I think a lot of us get very, very close to the canvas and that's great because you get to see all the details, but you can kind of lose how it all works together and how interconnected a lot of the subjects are. So what I would recommend is, you know, every five, 10 minutes, take five or six steps back from your painting, ensure that it's all working cohesively together because we've all had that scenario where we worked incredibly hard on a subject. It looked fantastic up close, but then we took their steps back and it just, it didn't work with anything else. And you kind of have to make the decision, do I change the rest of the painting or do I change this individual subject? And generally, you know, taking those steps back every five to 10 minutes will help you ensure that that's actually going to work. I also like to kind of plot my initial applications from a bit farther away. That way I can see how they work compositionally with everything else. The same goes for drawing, but you know, here we are heading up to the top of the canvas. I'm still rotating my brush quite a lot to get all of these very different applications. A lot of these leaves do look like they are simply falling here, which I like. It gives it more of a relaxed still look. Again, we might have touched on this at the beginning of the lesson, but the only scenario really that you'll find a lot of your foliage kind of moving in a singular direction, left, right, diagonal, etc., is on a windy day. And this scene isn't meant to be a windy day. It's meant to be something that's much more calm. So with that, I am trying to have a lot of these kind of with that drooping effect, but they are, you know, moving to the left and right on different angles. And I am trying to get a, a good back and forth with that. I'm also leaving a lot of the sky showing through just to ensure that we do have that additional depth and it looks natural. This isn't the largest branch. It's not going to look incredibly full. And with that here, I'm just kind of filling out that base. So we're now going to grab our half inch flat headed brush and head over to our palette where we will grab quite a bit of Mars black, about an equal amount of our green gold, a hint of our cerulean blue and then an even smaller hint of titanium white as well. This mixture should be slightly darker than the one we previously applied our base layer with. And here we are going to go and just tap in some of that extra detail. It's the same process as what we did over on the right hand side. However, again, this time we are working with these darker pigments and the next layer will vary, but we're still working for the most part with that three layer system, starting with with the filbert brush moving in to the flat headed brush and then finally ending with the fan brush here you can see that i'm moving my way out and this time i do want the uh, the majority of the darkest applications done on the far left hand side the side that actually is the side of the canvas and then as we get closer to the sky that's where we kind of let it dissipate we run out of paint and that's because the closer we get to that right hand side the more light that is hypothetically working its way through the leaves and wrapping itself around said leaves as well. So we're looking to build up that contrast and I'm also okay with going back over the layers that are closest to the edge a couple of times to really build that up. We do want more separation as we get closer to the actual sky though because there is that light pointing through. This again, quite the uh, lengthy process, so we're speeding it up. Now, once we have all of that nice and dry, we are going to grab our filbert brush, get a good amount of our burnt umber, just a hint of our titanium white and Mars black, and mix up a nice earthy brown here that again, isn't too saturated. I also want it to be a little bit brighter than our previously applied base layers. From there, I'm grabbing the smaller, what is now essentially a liner brush, but was once a round pointed brush that I did cut to just have the smallest little tip. And here I am starting to paint in some quite close trees, at least the base the trunk of them. And this is something that I want to be fairly delicate with, but I'm also not creating a singular soft stroke. I'm creating a stroke, I'm lifting my brush off the canvas, and then I'm going back, and then, you know, I'm continuously going through this process so that I don't have a perfectly straight line. In real life, when trees grow, generally they have these interesting movements to them. They kind of move to one side and then back to another. They have little knots, and I'm trying to create that authentic look to them. And the best way I've found of going about that is through a myriad of strokes rather than creating a single one. 
It's also worth noting here that I am starting with this fairly dark pigment. That way I can kind of figure out where I want things to be without hyper committing to the actual application. And I'm also applying some additional branches as you can see up in this top area. That way they don't all essentially just move vertically upwards. I'm also trying to you know give them a little bit of a lean one way or the other even if it's just by a couple degrees we do want to ensure that they all are different that they're starting at different spots so they're stopping at different spots and that they're quite unique after that i grab a little bit of additional titanium white mark that into our mixture and then i apply that to the right hand side of our trees that way they have a bit of a highlight from the you know, the actual light that's working its way through the open clusters of leaves on that right hand side. And I'm not doing this with all of them, it's predominantly and more so in the middle of all of the branches because the tops are more so going to be covered by shadow as are the bottoms. So I'm really just highlighting the middle area and allowing it to dissipate on either side. But with that, I think that's a nice subtle beginning look. Once we allow our tree trunks to dry, we are going to go back to our palette, grab quite a bit of our green gold, about an equal amount of titanium white, a little bit of Mars black there to desaturate, and then more titanium white to brighten it back up. I'm also throwing in just a hint of our cadmium yellow deep hue, and this is going to be for the highlights on the left-hand side foliage. Now, this is something that we've essentially done before. However, this time I do want it to have a slightly less of that yellow because we are closer to you know us and we're not going to have all of that warm atmospheric light like we did in the background. So here I am trying to keep it more so an actual green. And once I have what I want, I switch over to the fan brush because this again is really what's going to capture all of that detail. Great to apply pigment with, not great to mix pigment with. Now, here we're quite close, and you can see that I am rotating my brush quite a bit. I'm not rotating my brush when it's actually on the canvas. All of that is done after I peel that brush off the canvas, and that, of course, is done intentionally so that we don't have any streaks or actual strokes. Instead, we just get all of these intricate, interesting little tapping effects. And that rotation is occurring so that I can play with how light is wrapping around all of these. Right there, I am really trying to brighten up this area that has light because there is an opening in that cluster of foliage. You can see that blue sky shining through, and I want light to be illuminating all of the leaves that are kind of right past it. I'm also doing that to both the left and right hand side of this larger protruding space and attempting to keep the middle back portion of it fairly dark because that's essentially going to be the area that gets the least amount of light. In regards to this larger cluster that we have built on the left-hand side, the majority of the highlights should be on the right-hand side as that is closest to the sky. And then as we move over to the left-hand side, that should start to dissipate. Here though, I am bouncing around quite a lot. I'm trying not to do too much in any one area and keep it all fairly balanced. This is definitely a portion of the painting that, you know, requires a lot of detail, but you also want to take those steps back and ensure that it's all progressing very naturally, that you don't have too much highlight in one area, because as soon as you start doing that, you kind of force yourself to increase the highlights everywhere else, and you may not want to. So just ensure that you are frequently taking those steps back and ensuring that those highlights are exactly where you want them to be. Again, for the most part, it's going to be on the right hand side, then slowly wrapping around to the left, but also right behind any openings where you see quite a lot of that blue sky right next to where my brush is right now is, a, you know, that's a pretty good example. And I am overlapping leaves too. That way we do get a lot of dimension. We are going to build quite a bit of depth through that process because not all of these leaves are the same value. Some of them do look darker because we applied those layers when we didn't have as much paint, so they're semi-transparent. But overall, I'm very happy with that area. While we still need to create some highlights on the actual foliage, we're going to take a little bit of a break from there and create some grass on the bottom left hand side. This is going to be done through a series of strokes with the fan brush. I'm essentially applying the 
tips of the brush to the canvas and then I'm doing a slight drag to the right and then downwards, creating hopefully a myriad of strokes. This is just going to be the base layer. We will go back and add more highlights to it, but it's important that we do this now so that the color is cohesive with everything else. So once we have all of that darker grass applied and dried, we are going to head back to our palette, grab quite a lot of our green gold, a little bit of titanium white, and also a hint of Mars black as well. This is a pigment that should be slightly brighter than our previous application, but I don't want it to be too bright, and I also want it to be fairly natural at this point. So I'm not using too much titanium white because I don't want to desaturate something that is so close to us. Remember those subjects that you know we can almost reach out and touch should have fairly natural saturation and coloring. It's not going to get all of that reflective light so close up. So here I am going with a bit more of a natural green, and I'm continuing to apply this in the areas that we've kind of pre-established as highlighted pieces of foliage, areas that are already slightly brighter. So at this point, we're kind of moving into more of a natural cathartic application process. It's a little less thought intensive, though you should still be thinking about your applications and where you want to apply them, but a lot of the general ideas and rules have already been set. We know that the light, for the most part, is coming from that right-hand side. It's illuminating that, you know, big body of foliage and it's dissipating as we move towards the left, but that this piece that protrudes actually gets light on both the top and the bottom with the middle area being a little bit darker. It's one of those neat subjects that light has the opportunity to wrap around in a couple of different ways. I'm also going back and adding more highlights right behind all of those openings where we do get to see the sky. That way we do have that light kind of pouring in. It's happening in multiple different areas. It's not just one large cluster of highlights. You kind of have these different little patches of it and that definitely makes it feel significantly more natural. Here you can also see that I am continuously rotating my brush, that as I do start to run out of pigment, I do work more towards that left-hand side because it is going to be more semi-transparent. We're not going to get that natural, extremely bright, vibrant green, and we have a bit more opportunity to play with something subtle and just kind of build up those layers as well. That said, here I am back at the palette remixing more paint because while we're applying a lot of very small applications, they are a lot of applications, right? We are actually using quite a bit of paint and I did decide to not mix up too much initially. This is something I like to do throughout the process and that I'll mix up a little bit. I'll kind of try to memorize how I got there. I'll apply that to the canvas and then I'll go back later and try to remix more. It just kind of reaffirms those ideas so that you can take them with you into future paintings and you're not kind of thinking, oh well, how did I mix that color? No, we've really thought about it. We've practiced a couple of times and we've, you know, really solidified it in our heads. From there, I do go back to my palette though. I mixed up a slightly brighter mixture. This time we do have a bit more of that yellow and this is just such a beautiful highlight. It really connects with a lot of the other highlights that we've had in the painting, though it's slightly darker. I didn't want it to be exactly the same. I didn't want them to blend perfectly together. And then once I have the majority of those applications applied, I switch to, again, what was once my round point brush, but at this point is essentially a liner brush because I did cut the majority of the bristles off here. You just, you want something very small, very refined, very sharp, and I'm just tapping in actual little pieces of foliage. Now, had we done this from the start, it would have taken forever. Thanks to the fan brush, we were really able to expedite this process. However, the fan brush it has a very unique shape, right? And you won't always be able to render the exact details that you want with it. It, you know, gets the larger idea done, but you'll probably want to go back in with something like this, at least in the foreground of the details, and just ensure that all of the highlights are exactly where you want them to be, that the movements are correct, and you can even add in just little interesting, intricate pieces to really add to the believability. But right there, I am very, very happy. So once we have all of those highlights applied to the top of our foliage, we are going to start applying some additional highlights 
to the bottom of our grass. That way we do balance the painting. Now this is of course mixed with the filbert brush and this mixture is something that I want to be slightly less uh, poppy. I, I want it to be saturated because we are close to us in the foreground but I don't want it to take away from all of the highlights in the trees that we have in the foreground. So I throw in a little bit of additional titanium white, maybe a little bit of extra Mars black. That way it's still nice and bright but it's just not that bright. With that, the general technique here is I'm taking that smaller round pointed brush that I did cut, I'm making sure that it's nice and damp so that I can get some very sharp applications, and then when I'm crafting my grass here, the majority of it is moving from the left to the right and then kind of falling down. We will have some stray pieces that kind of act and make it look very organic, but that is the general movement. And when it comes to actual application here, when I make my first contact, on the canvas, I try to ensure that I'm using as minimal amount of pressure as possible. That way I'm getting the smallest stroke. Then, as I get towards maybe the middle of the grass, I start to apply slightly more pressure. This is going to expand the bristles on the brush and really open it up. It's going to give it a nice movement. Then, as I approach the end of the blade of grass, I start to relieve pressure so that the stroke gets smaller again, and then I kind of whip it off the canvas. That way, we have something that's nice and tight in the beginning, it moves into this beautiful body in the grass, and then yet again, it ends being a bit more tight. So it's a really nice movement and motion for your grass. It keeps it dynamic, it's a very natural look, and it's what I'm aiming to achieve through this process. It's not always achievable, <laughs> especially in an area as small as this, but it's the general idea, and it's something you can take with you into future paintings. It's easier when you have more space and when you have more actual room, you know, uh, larger grass to work with. That said, here you can also see me just doing more of those little pieces that do flip up, keep it organic, keep it natural. We had that same discussion with the leaves earlier. You're never really going to have all of them pointing in a singular direction unless you have a lot of wind, but in a relaxed setting like this, you do want some stray pieces of grass that do continue to keep the piece engaging for the audience. It might seem like such a small thing, but really those are the details that subconsciously keep us engaged, so it's important to continuously implement them. I'm also going over different pieces of grass a couple of times to build up that highlight. I want a variance in values. I want some to be darker, some to be lighter. That way it looks like they're layered on top of one another and some of them are catching more light than others. I'm also keeping some areas a little bit darker just to add additional variance. So at this point, we're quite happy with all of our foliage, our grass at the bottom, and now it's time to start incorporating the larger trees in the foreground. Right here, I just have a little time lapse of me drawing it in with Conte. I do love to draw over acrylic paint with Conte because generally it doesn't leave any color, it comes off with water, and it's essentially just like chalk, but you know, you can allocate different colors to different subjects. That said, here I am grabbing some Mars Black, some of our burnt umbrella a tiny bit of titanium white as well, and I'm just going to start by crafting the edges of said tree with the half inch flat headed brush. This time I'm using one that's less disheveled because I do want those bristles to be nice and condensed. This brush is quite damp at the moment. And again, that's going to ensure that I get the cleanest lines that I possibly can, that I can you know, really drag that paint out for a farther distance. And that's nice because I'm not continuously going back to the palette. It does mean that I'll have to do a couple of layers to make sure that it's nice and thick, but it is really helping me get those detailed edges that I do want. I'm also not, you know, going in and doing a single application, a single line. I'm trying to move the brush a little bit. I take the brush off the canvas and then I put it back on. I continue to move from there. We are still trying to instigate all of those little different motions within the tree, within the branches, all of those starts and stops, because it is going to make it look just so much more natural. We're also continuously attempting, in the very least, to make our branches smaller as we progressively move upward in the painting. I am aware that it's not currently that way. I do need to thicken the middle portion right before it splits off, but 
that is something that we're continuously working towards and it's just one of those logical steps right the higher your branches are the farther out they are the more young they are they're still growing they're smaller and the weight of them can't you know pull down the rest of the tree so with that these are just progressively getting smaller and smaller i'm starting to just do little taps for additional branches as well there's a, a nice little one and there's a branch coming off of the other branch i start with a minimal amount of these I try to jump around so that I don't have too many in any one particular area. And here yet again, we have another time lapse because it can be a little bit of a time consuming process. We're not really doing too much detail and we're not really changing much of the color, but it is still a relatively large amount of space to cover. And I am doing multiple layers because I am using quite a bit of water. Here I am slowly getting into the smaller branches and I'm trying to apply again as little pressure as I possibly can in those areas especially because I do want a very sharp clean line and that's really the best way of going about it. Now we're intertwining and really interweaving these branches in between a lot of that foliage. We have it kind of go behind some and then it pops out in a different area with a slightly smaller branch. And all in all, I think that it's starting to look really quite natural. Here we have another close up where you can see me just work in these incredibly small branches and thicken a couple of our more dominant areas. Once we have that base layer applied and dried, I am going back to my smaller round pointed brush. We are grabbing some of our burnt umber, titanium white, Mars black, and this mixture is going to be a little bit brighter than our previous application. It is going to be more so the middle value and the start to building light and depth in our tree. That said, I am also still trying to keep it slightly more desaturated. It's very much in the foreground, but I don't want a saturated bark. So here, we do have quite a bit of gray left in that and when I go to start applying it I'm doing so on the right hand side of the tree because that is the side that is facing all of our light I'm also not doing so with a singular long stroke I'm trying to do a tap and drag effect so I tap that edge and then I move the brush down I lift the brush and then I go back in and do the same it builds some really nice texture and then once I'm done moving my way down the tree I go back and I start working right in behind that initial application and it's going to be a little bit more transparent it'll be a little bit darker because you can see that base layer through it you'll start out, you know just kind of building that depth having that light wrap around having it dissipate as it moves towards that left hand side and by occasionally leaving little openings in between those highlights you're going to create this really nice effect where it looks like there are two protruding pieces of bark and then in between there's kind of this crevice so that the shadow is still in the light can't really wrap into there and it's just this great additional little effect that I definitely recommend working in so don't feel like you need to make it look absolutely perfect or fill in all of those spaces having that rough aesthetic that rough look is really going to do the tree a lot of good here specifically I am working with a slightly brighter pigment adding some extra highlight to the top again the areas that are going to be receiving the most light but I'm not going all the way up the branch and I'm also not going all the way down at the tree stump I want to ensure that those are slightly darker because the foliage and the grass that are around them will cast a little bit of a shadow making it slightly darker and so we're just trying to be mindful full of those natural shadows. Here I'm working on the smaller branches, trying to apply as little pressure as I possibly can, and I'm still not applying the highlight to every area, being very selective and slowly building it up. But with that, I like that amount. All right, so now that we have all of the bark incorporated, it's time to go back to our greens. We are using the smaller round pointed brush. We're building up a fairly bright green and we're going to use this for a couple of things. The first is to just add a couple of highlights that I forgot to add into the background around some of our trees. This is going to just give the painting a little bit more dimension and have it be just more cohesive. Then I'm going to take this same small round pointed brush and I'm going to add 
actually apply some of the foliage on top of the base of our trees. This is going to push them back a little bit more in the painting. It's going to give us more dimension because again, we really don't want it to look like our trees simply exist in front of all of the foliage. We want it to look like they're, you know, really intertwining with it. So here I'm kind of initially being fairly careful with it. I'm not applying too much over any area. And this is also a process that I would recommend doing from a bit of a distance if you can. That way you can accurately gauge kind of how much you want in any specific area. It's very easy to quickly overdo it. I've done that with so many paintings in the past and it's just a lot easier to add more than it is to kind of take it away and kind of repaint your tree, which admittedly isn't the most difficult thing. So don't worry about that. I mean, we are working Working with acrylics they are just such a forgiving medium but here as you can see I start with a couple of them I start to move them out and we are trying to move it over a couple of our branches so that it looks like branches also move towards us produce leaves and create a more three-dimensional shape and it's also worth noting a couple of their strokes there looked a little bit thin you can still see a bit of the bark through them I am using quite a bit of water so I am going back and just redoing that layer Now we're going to jump back into this with a half inch flat headed brush. This is the one that isn't too disheveled because I do want some very particular applications. I'm grabbing some Mars black, a little bit of our green, a little bit of titanium white, but the majority of the mixture here is done with that Mars black. And we're going to use this to start crafting the base layer of a lot of the rocks that line the edge of our river here. So as I move, I start in the background, start with the smallest applications. Again, very little pressure then as I move closer to us in the foreground I start to apply more pressure with my brush I expand those applications so that the rocks actually get bigger again we're working with perspective we're creating a little bit of depth despite the fact that we at this point really only have a silhouette and I'm also frequently trying to create all of these little protruding rocks as you can see they kind of stick out at different angles at different points I want them to be always changing, right? I, I wanted to continuously progress in the same way all of our trees did. And that is something that I'm very much keeping in the back of my head, though I do still have the drawing because we didn't cover that with any paint yet, which is very efficient. So here I'm going to save us a little bit of time and just finish off this nice little silhouette here. The next step here is really a lot of fun. We're going to be using the smaller round pointed brush. We're grabbing about an equal mixture of our green gold and our cadmium yellow deep hue. Then we're adding quite a bit of titanium white and just a hint of Mars black as well. From there, I'm going to test it on my reference photo. Just make sure that we are nice and close. And I like it, but it could be slightly more yellow. So I do grab just a little bit of that for our mixture and test yet again. From there, I know that I'm quite happy and we start moving into the actual canvas. Now we're going to start creating moss with this color and we're going to apply it predominantly in the areas which receive the most light. In this scenario, with the rock being placed where it is, we're going to have a lot of light on the top of the rock and on the left hand side. So I start by crafting that edge. I'm not doing so with any longer strokes. This is very much a tap and drag effect, quite similar to how we went about the bark. However, we're going to be a little bit more random with our movements and the strokes aren't going to be as long as they were in the bark, but it's the same sort of idea. We want something that looks fairly rough, fairly inconsistent, and we're going to simply work our way back in the rocks, allow our paint to dissipate, allow it to become more semi-transparent and therefore darker so that we have the light wrapping its way around the moss and our rocks. That said, this, much like every other subject in this process, is going to take a number of layers. So don't feel discouraged if initially it looks a little messy. That can happen because we have so many very close rocks and very loose definition in the beginning. Just believe in the process, believe in yourself, you will get there and those layers, they will make a big difference. But here I am going in, continuing with that little tapping motion and 
again, my approach to this is very much less is more. We can always go back and add more of these little taps. We can always go back and build additional highlights. So we're going to do that once we have a fair number of rocks established and we have a good idea of how bright we want this whole area to be because if we make one rock extremely high contrast very yellow then we kind of have to commit that to a number of other rocks so that it looks like it makes sense and then all of a sudden you run the risk of it essentially overshadowing all of your foliage so i'm being fairly careful we're adding just a hint of this slightly brighter mixture now on to these rocks and already it's starting to give us some additional definition. It's breaking the rocks up, and that is very much the goal. Here, I'm working on the top of this rock. It's much more of a shelf-like rock than the other ones. We have kind of a triangular rock. We have one that's a bit more of a rectangle. We have one that kind of looks more like a turtle shell. So again, trying to create all of these different little aesthetic instances. And that's something that we did attempt to do initially with our drawing, but here we do have a second chance to really diversify if that's something we kind of feel like maybe we got a little bit lazy with in the drawing process. Admittedly, I'm not working in as many rocks as I saw in the reference photo, but I'm simply simplifying it a little bit because there were so many rocks and we don't have that much space to include that much visual information. Whenever you go into a painting, you want to consider how much time you want to allocate to it and also uh, <laughs> how much detail you want in it because there's a, there's a balance in there, right? The larger the canvas, the longer it will take, but the more detail you can incorporate into it, the more rocks, the more foliage, right? But you might not want to spend a thousand hours on a painting. So you might not go with a six foot by six foot painting. You might go with something that's uh, 11 by nine or you know just like a, a smaller canvas that you can do within a day or two. And I think that <laughs> kind of deciding that early on is always a great step. Here, what's actually quite interesting is you can see my pinky finger on the canvas. I rest it like that to take any shake out of my hand. Sometimes I drink a little bit too much coffee. Sometimes I stay up a little too late editing these videos and just kind of figuring things out. And you know, I don't always have the most control with my hand. I don't think anybody really does. It's something you can work on. It's something you can practice, but there are going to be days where you're going to be a little bit more shaky and just extending your pinky finger and placing it on a dry area of the canvas can be a great way of incorporating additional control into your application. And I'm definitely utilizing it in this because there are so many small rocks and you can see that the farther we get back, the smaller they get. I'm also leaving some opening dark areas because I could tell that my technique was starting to get fairly similar and I wanted to take a break from that area so that I had time to kind of figure out the next step, how I wanted to change those rocks and continue to make things look different. So if you find that an area is getting a little too visually samey, jump to another area and you know that gives you some time to kind of alter how you're going about things. And that area, it's also going to you know contain larger or smaller rocks, which is beneficial because it's going to force you to change what you're doing. At this point, I decided to move the camera back because this is an area that it would be very easy to overdo detail-wise, but it's the background, it's the distance. We need to ensure that we keep it relatively simple so that it doesn't overshadow what we have in the foreground or get too complicated to the point where it doesn't really make sense because when something's that far away you can't really pick up on that much detail so here we are looking at this from a bit of a distance that's how i'd recommend painting it take your steps back and just make sure that you're continuing to not overdo it that, that you're pacing yourself and that when you go in to add highlights like this you don't add too much to any one area. You can see that here I am really jumping around, even adding some back to the foreground. But once I feel fairly comfortable with all of that, once I feel like it's nice and balanced, here we do get a lot closer. I build up an even brighter highlight, this with some additional yellow, and now we can go in and pick some quite, you know, very select rocks. I don't want to do this to all of them. We're going to be fairly particular. And that's important because not all rocks are the same. 
Not all types of moss are the same. Some are going to be more wet, some are going to be more reflective. Here in the background, again, we have a lot of light. It's a more open area. So I'm actually applying more highlight to these as a whole as I am to the ones in the foreground, but I'm also eliminating detail. That way it doesn't capture as much attention, really just trying to find that balance. But with that, it is a fairly time consuming process. So here we are going to speed things up just a little bit. And I'll also throw a couple little plants in the background, which we will expand upon in the foreground in just a second. So for this next step, we're actually going to take a step back here. And as you can see through my palette, I actually ended up painting over a lot of the plants that we had right above the rocks. And I did so just with that same darker green. I really just kind of redid that layering process. And now I'm going back in with the smaller round pointed brush. And here we are going to paint individual little leaves in a very similar way to how we painted our grass, just in that we are using a minimal amount of pressure. Our brush has a lot of water in it. I'm using a nice highlighted pigment. And here I like to start with the spine of each leaf, and then I work on all of the pieces that kind of come off of it. I generally start on the side that is facing us because it's a fairly simple motion. It kind of looks like a little banana. And then on the other side, we kind of have it arch over and then sometimes overlap that spine as well. These all also should be a little bit different from one another. They are coming from the same plant hypothetically or the same you know, cluster of plants, the same type of plants, but we still want them to be original enough. So I'm trying to add different angles to them. Some of them are more forward facing. Some of them are more angled off towards the water. And I predominantly have them in those two specific uh, kind of orientations because I want to visually move the eye into the painting and these are going to act as miniature leading lines, right? If the eye catches them on the side of the painting, it's not going to follow them off the painting, it's going to follow them into the painting. They are painted to point inwards. So that's something I was very much focusing on. I also overlapped a fair number of them and now I'm taking some of those highlights and yet again, just adding more so to the rocks. This is something that I'll do throughout the process now that we have them there. I just, again, didn't want to do too much all at once, and it's something we're just going to touch up as we feel like we can. Anyways, as we have time to digest it, we can go back and add more and build on it. Here, I'm going back and adding to the spines specifically, making those a little bit brighter. That way we have some areas of these plants that kind of pop more than others. Now the top of our painting is starting to look quite good, so we're going to head down into the bottom where, with my half inch flat headed brush, I do grab quite a bit of Mars Black, about an equal mixture of our green gold, and then about half that of Titanium White. And the goal here is to render a fairly dark green that will match that of what we have in the water, more so around the middle ground to background. My first attempt there did end up being a little bit too dark, so here we are heading back to the palette, grabbing some titanium white, and this is significantly closer. Though it's worth noting that if you look at my brush, the paint isn't blended perfectly on it. You have this little spot of titanium white off to the corner. So when I apply my pigment, I actually get a couple of different options there. And whenever you want to actually apply paint to the canvas, make sure that you have a very consistent mixture on your brush, that it isn't kind of mixed in a lazy fashion. You have, you know, more of one color on one side, more of another color on the other. It can be kind of convenient when matching colors on a palette, but when you're actually applying them, make sure that that's fairly correct. That said, I did mix up what I wanted there, and now I'm switching to the one inch flat headed brush. So this one's about double the size. We are doing a greater mixture. That way I don't have to continuously go back to my palette because I do want to mix pretty much all of this while it's still wet on the canvas and get a very smooth blend. So I switched over to a larger brush. This one's fantastic because it also has a really sharp edge. So as you can see, I can just cut along all of the bottom of the rocks here. And I'm not doing a straight line at all. 
There are lots of little indents that I'm kind of working my way into, and I'm trying to ensure that we don't kind of oversimplify that edge because, again, those rocks are going to protrude at different angles and to different extents. So I am keeping that in the back of my head. I'm using the corner of this brush to really render in some details, and then I'm starting to work my way outwards. General rule, I do like to start on the edge of my subjects because that is when you have the most paint on your brush, you have the most control, you have the sharpest applications. And then once I kind of start to run out of paint, I either go back to the palette and grab more or I move myself kind of into the body of the subject, very much like what we were doing with the foliage in the beginning of the lesson, like we did with the trees. It's a great general rule to ensure that you have the most control when you need it. That said, if you do accidentally go over some of these rocks here, don't worry about it. We are working with acrylics. It is very malleable. And, you know, we can always just go back in and paint those rocks atop this water a little bit later on. And I actually do end up incorporating quite a number of rocks on top of this in our following steps. But here, I essentially got to the middle of the canvas. And I like what we have here. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new spot on our palette grab quite a lot of Mars Black, about an equal mixture, Cerulean Blue, just a hint of Titanium White. We do want this to be slightly darker than our previous application of the green, and I'm going to start applying it right down here in the bottom of our canvas. Now, I am applying a lot of this in a horizontal stroke so that I do get a very consistent application and we are going to speed this up because despite the fact that it's an easy application that we're not doing, you know, a lot with a gradient or what have you, it's still a lot of space and so it will take some time. I also just wanted to apply it as quickly as I could because I want to blend the blue and the green right here while they are both still wet. So we acted with a lot of urgency. And if you don't get it the first time, that's okay. You can do a wet into dry blend, or you can just go back and add more green up top and then blend it down into the blue. So don't feel like you have to make that deadline. There are definitely ways around it that are going to make it look just as good, but for convenience's sake, I did want to kind of get it done in a single go, and that is what we are doing right here. So now I'm just moving that blue up into the green. We're getting a really nice blend. We have a good gradient, and at this point, we essentially don't have either flat color. We have some blue that starts at the very bottom, it starts to transition into some green, and you know we don't have a big block of green anymore. I'm also bringing that blue down and that green down as you can see here. So I do really like what we got done with that and now I can kind of head back in with the smaller round pointed brush and just kind of fix up some areas that the larger flat brush wasn't able to accomplish. Now that we have all of our water completely dry, I am heading back in with some Conte and sketching all of the rocks that you do see above in the reference photo. Again, this could be done a bit more precisely using the traceable, but I do feel fairly confident as I have drawn them previously and I have a good idea of the general flow. That said, I'm now switching to the half inch flat headed brush about an equal mixture of Mars black and burnt umber, just a hint of titanium white. And then I say, you know what? We're moving into the foreground. I want it to be slightly slightly more saturated, so I do go back and grab some additional burnt umber for that. And this is going to be the base layer for the rocks that we have right here. Now, I chose this brush very specifically because it does have that really nice sharp edge, so you can craft the tops of rocks really efficiently. I think it looks quite natural, and you also have a fairly thick body in the brush, so you can fill in those larger areas with real efficiency. Generally, brushes are going to be multi-purpose, and I just adore using brushes like this specifically for our rocks. Here, we are just working on the base layer, so we're not really trying to create any depth in these early stages. It's a lot like what we did with the rocks with the moss over up and above. But here, I am <laughs> kind of working on the rocks that are going to be larger initially because I haven't gone back and grabbed more water or paint. That is something we're going to do right now and this is going to give us the opportunity to work on smaller rocks yet again. As a general rule, I do like to work on, you know, the edges first 
and I also like to work on areas that just need to be more meticulous first. And because we had already established three or four rocks by the time I needed to get to a smaller one, we didn't have the correct amount of water still in the brush. We didn't have the correct amount of paint. And I knew that to, you know, really get that paint on there, I'd have to apply a little bit of additional pressure. We wouldn't get that soft, very clean touch that we would need to render that smaller detail. And so in those scenarios, I don't kind of try to force those applications into the smaller little rocks and subjects. I do kind of work more so with the larger subjects. I fill in the body as I do run out of paint, and then I go back to the palette. I grab more paint, I grab more water, and we return to those smaller subjects, which are then significantly easier to work with. Here we are now going into the background, and this is quite the detailed area, trying to be very mindful of my applications and still trying to make all of these rocks look different from one another. We will have an opportunity with the moss to further elaborate on them. That's something we did do with a lot of the rocks in the foreground, but you still want your general shapes to be quite interesting. And that's what we are attempting to achieve right here. So I'm moving farther and farther back into the painting. I do have a lot of water on my brush because I do want these to be very sharp. That does mean that we may have to go back and do a second application over some of them just to ensure that they are nice and thick, but it really is worth it, especially in areas like this. You also notice that we're covering the majority of our water in the background. Don't be afraid to do that. Sometimes you do need to cover subjects you really like to make things look natural or just to improve the painting as a whole. Here I am heading back and just doing some of those secondary layers because again, we did work with some pretty thin paint. And with that, I'm quite happy with this general flow and movement in our rocks. So once we have all of those rocks nice and dry, we're going to head back in with the smaller round pointed brush and a fairly light green, but something that we can definitely build on top of. We are working on the base layer of our moss right now. We're doing so with a myriad of taps just as we did before in the background. However, we're now in the foreground. We have more space and we have an opportunity to render more detail. So this is something that you're really going to want to take your time with, to be meticulous with and it's actually just so much fun to build all of this moss it again like a lot of acrylic subjects looks a little messy in its initial layers but we do definitely get it there i'm now heading back to my brush because as you can see i did kind of run out of that paint and i was getting to the point where i really had to apply pressure to get more onto the canvas and we don't want that we really don't want that especially here in the foreground where all of those sharp lines and applications matter so i am starting again at the top of the rock on the side of the rock that receives the most light and then i move back down and inwards very much much in the same way we do with the rest of our subjects, but we're not looking for a clean generic blend or gradient like what we put in the water. Here instead, we are just looking for more of a series of taps. Here I'm also running out of paint again, running out of water, I recognize that. And so rather than continuing to force that, we do go and grab some more. I'm also using my pinky finger here to rest on the easel so that I can eliminate more of that shake from my hand, get a bit of a cleaner application. And here we're doing a lot of this from a bit of a distance. That way I don't incorporate too, too much detail early on, especially with an early layer that I know I'm going to build on top of. So here's your friendly reminder yet again that throughout this painting process, while it's good to get up close and really work on those details, when you want to cover such a wide space, you're probably going to want to take a step back and make sure that you're just not overdoing it, especially in the beginning. Here I am now able to go back in and add some additional moss, really working my way in and back with the rocks, not necessarily saying that the top is this very thin thing, but you know, having a different levels, being able to have kind of shelves within those rocks, it's important and it makes a big difference. Here I have switched to a slightly brighter green, and this again is much more reminiscent of what we were using previously. I'm using this in the background because again, that background area, it's much more lit. You're getting significantly more of that sunlight coming in. It's very warm. It's casting these very yellowish 
highlights and it's definitely something that you want to kind of progressively move into as you work towards that background right so that's something that i am focusing on creating that transition all of this moss is not the same and then i'm also grabbing a pigment that is fairly similar to what we used in the foreground and just kind of making that connective tissue between the two sets of rocks because we don't want it to essentially go from something that's a bit more muted and you know more on the green side to immediately just something that's saturated and more so yellow we want that really natural transition and because the rocks here are all done in a fairly similar way despite the fact that they all look different I am speeding up some of this footage because I do think this probably took me about half an hour to get all of these just kind of sketched in the way I wanted to like that but here back to the palette we're grabbing quite a lot of our yellow a little bit of our golden green quite a bit of our titanium white really mixing up something bright something fairly saturated and now while being very careful we can have some additional highlight here in the middle ground so i'm going in to the top areas the areas that i feel will be the brightest and i'm adding that in i am not i repeat i am not going back and recovering everything that we just did with our previous layer i'm being selective i'm saying okay which area honestly of this is going to have you know moss that's a bit more fresh looking or is receiving more light because it can really be a number of things that causes the additional brightness or the additional saturation right it isn't necessarily always just going to be light sometimes something's going to be wet and therefore it's going to have more of a shimmer the subject itself can reflect light differently and the actual types of moss could be different as well here we're not actually painting moss it's more so the implication of moss because we're still at a distance even in the foreground but i think that this is starting to look really natural and i'm really happy with the general look here i am heading back into the background and just brightening up a lot of those edges ensuring that it is consistently the brightest place and overall i'm really happy with how far we got with just two layers <laughs> Now, while we aren't completely done with our rocks and moss, I do want to let that dry. And in the meantime, we're going to start working on the details in the water. Here, you can see that I'm mixing with a half inch flat headed brush. I've grabbed quite a lot of titanium white and just a hint of Mars black and a hint of cerulean blue as well. This is going to desaturate the color, give it just a slightly more cool look. And here you can see that I'm trying to get it really quite bright. With that, I'm not going with the first pigment I come to, and I'd heavily recommend, you know, always going back, trying different things, and really ensuring that you are achieving what you want. Here, yet again, I realized that I wanted it to be a little bit brighter. I do think that we found that correct mix there with the third application, and I'm also mixing up a bit more of a blue variant for the foreground. As you can see, the color does change a little bit. Now I'm going to grab the smaller round pointed brush. I did cut this one, so again, it is very tiny. And now we're going to start heading in with those details. This brush is very wet. I'd like to put that out there. It's probably more wet than anything else that I've used. I'm predominantly going to go in here and work along the bottom, the base of my rocks, but also expand in a couple of different ways. This is the water moving. It's going to make the piece feel significantly more dynamic. It's going to add enough detail into this bottom area that it can kind of compete with that of the top of the painting without kind of feeling feeling too overwhelming and it's really really fun i've always loved painting moving water especially around rocks because you kind of have this relatively intuitive template in that you know that the water the highlight is going to show up right around the bottom of each rock so you kind of have a great starting point and i'm also not trying to create just a flat line around the bottom of each rock because the rocks you know they move out horizontally vertically they're stretching towards us in all of these odd different ways and i'm trying to capture that as well but as soon as i move away from the rock 
I do move to more of a pure horizontal stroke. So you have this subtle movement around the rocks and then you have something that's going to create some really nice pattern. This is also something that's very easy to overdo, so I would recommend painting quite a bit of it from a distance. And here, yet again, we're going to cover up the majority of the color and the water that we did work and mix initially. I know that when a lot of people begin painting, that's something that they don't love the idea of because you know we worked so hard, we, we crafted this, we're really proud of that blend. But in a lot of scenarios, you kind of need to let go of those past layers to make the painting all that it can be. And that's what we're doing right here. So I'm slowly just stretching this up, trying to get those applications smaller and smaller as you move farther and farther away from us. They can get larger as we now move more so into the middle ground. And you are about to see some of the really neat movements and detail work as well. So with that, I'm now moving on to the right hand side kind of working in between and around all of these rocks here. We're again, not going with straight lines. And I'm also continuing to do that tap effect that I love. So we're not simply creating a singular application. We're creating a lot of taps and drags just to get some extra texture and movement in there. And then I'm also using some of this water to connect into the foreground. You can see that it moves off far to the left, far to the right. And then we kind of start shifting the motion in the water so that it starts pointing more diagonally towards each corner of the painting with a little bit of a transitionary area that does still work more so with a horizontal movement in the middle, but it has a bit more of a flow to it. That way it's a bit more interesting. Because our applications are so watery, I am having to go back and reincorporate some of those highlights in the middle of our applications to really brighten it up give it some additional depth that is an important step that really does add a lot and you see me continuously go back to previous applications and just kind of continue to give them a bit of a visual boost so I'm doing that right now we've already applied all of this I know that I like these areas I know that I want to further work with them and that is exactly what I'm doing right here we're just going to the middle we're allowing the paint to dissipate on either side so that you kind of have this nice transition where it becomes more semi-transparent on each side and it has a good flow to it. Here I'm also now starting to move into the foreground but we'll do that in another step. Now I did purposely break up the middle ground water highlights and the foreground water highlights because I do feel that they're rendered in a fairly different technique with different ideas. In the background we can't see all of that detail, a lot of it is these horizontal strokes with the exception of when we're moving around the base of a rock. However, in the foreground you can see a lot more and so we have an opportunity to build additional detail and make it significantly more interesting. We are starting right here on the left hand side of the canvas around one of our rocks and I'm essentially trying to move the water around the rock. I'm trying to give it this flow. It's almost like a planet with an atmosphere and then this sense of gravity around it, right? And everything is kind of revolving around it. That's essentially what we are attempting to do with our water. We are moving all of that water around it as if it is kind of pulling it in these different directions. Now, right here, the water is actually going to be falling. I'm going to create a couple of different levels and shelves for the water to work on. Again, we're in the foreground. We can actually notice these really fun details. So the water is going to be falling from the left-hand side in the middle, from the right-hand side. We're going to have this almost like mini waterfall section right here. And so the water is going to meet in the middle with one side kind of taking dominance and then swooping out there to the left. Here I'm also applying some of those highlights to the bottom of this rock. And because we're in the foreground, we can get more creative with those applications that do again go on the bottom of the rock because we have actually more space to play with. So really, really wonderful to, you know, kind of take all of those ideas that we've been incorporating previously in the painting and really getting to explore them in a greater way. Now, we're also going to have another little bit of falling water over here to the left, and I'm really bouncing around with my subjects and at least the areas of water that I want to work on here, because there are some, some areas that you'll find that you're very confident with, 
and it's great to go in and incorporate those while you kind of figure out how you want the rest of it to move. I am looking at the reference photo. I have sketched in all of the general movements that I want, but actually going in and painting them is a different story, right? I think that we've all had these very elaborate drawings on our canvas and we say, oh, where, where do I want to start? How do I start? And I, I don't know that that ever really goes away, but I think it keeps it interesting. It keeps it really fun and, you know, still an exploratory process where you do feel like you're always learning and, you know, continuing to understand subjects, get better at the medium and the craft. That said, this is going to look admittedly a little messy as most initial acrylic layers do and that's going to happen for a couple of reasons we do need to go back in and add additional highlights to a lot of this we're going to want to rework areas some of the falling water is actually facing us right so it's not going to be receiving as much light as the rest of it so we do need to go in and darken some of it we're going to go in and do some glazes and i'm really excited to show you all of that but right now we're essentially just focusing on the movements and the flow here i'm doing a lot of essentially little bumps as you can see almost in the same way we'd paint highlights on a very rocky almost uh, dirt covered road and i'm doing that because the water is spilling in from a number of different directions it's going to kind of crash in the middle here and so we're going to get something that has a lot of movement but in no particular direction right so we moved more into those horizontal strokes but with a little bit of a bump here the water is moving off to the right so i'm adding some additional highlights going in with a bit of a thicker pigment but for the most part this is all still very wet because I do want the sharpest applications possible. I don't want a lot of tooth from the canvas showing up in this particular subject. Sometimes that does look really great when you're working on rocks, sand, that sort of thing. Having that grit from the canvas can actually be an aid, but we're working on fairly smooth water here, so I'm trying to get some really nice sharp applications. I'm also initially leaving a lot of space in between these highlighted applications, but much like the background, we will kind of fill that in over time and start to condense areas but that's something that has to happen later because we don't know initially what areas we really want to condense we could if we followed the reference photo exactly but if you're like me you also like to take artistic liberties kind of go off do your own thing make it your own and so I do like to again work a bit more safely initially and then we kind of fill out areas like I was just doing right there and what I'm about to do right over here. So I'm also kind of expanding to the left hand side of this rock with a bit more of a tapping effect and as we get farther and farther away from that rock we do get to move back into more of that horizontal stroke and there's that slow transition into it that you can see myself kind of highlighting right here. So we don't want the same movement around the entirety of the rock. We do want it to start to change. And this is where we kind of get to a point where we're creating an aesthetic that can look quite interesting. Now I've made this mixture just a little bit more blue. I did want some additional color in the foreground. Again, that's where things do get slightly more saturated. And I'm really happy with how a lot of this is starting to progress. But again, around those edges, trying to get something slightly more semi-transparent and something that does get more horizontal. So your very opaque applications are close to the rock and then they dissipate as you kind of move farther out. And the more we add highlights there, the more opportunity I have highlights or rather to add highlights in the background because we no longer need to keep it as simple to kind of keep it working together and having that flow. The more we add to one area, the more we can add to the other generally. So here I am now going to start doing a bit of this painting from a bit of a distance. We pulled back the camera and that's just so we can ensure that we have the general movements and highlights where we want them and that we're not kind of overdoing it. Once I'm fairly happy with that, I recognize that I want some additional highlighted areas or at least more defined areas right here in the bottom middle of the canvas. So I'm finding the applications that I really like. I'm starting to accentuate them, but I'm also creating some brand new ones as well. And again, so much of this is being done with just a little bit of a tap and drag effect. That way we get these very small, sharp details that, you know, very much 
are something you can see in the foreground of your painting and I really like where this is going. So once we have all of our general line work implemented here, we're actually going to start adding some additional depth into our water and playing with our color. With that, I'm grabbing quite a lot of cerulean blue, Mars black, just a hint of titanium white, and I'm creating a mixture that's slightly brighter than what we have in the real background of our water. Then I'm applying it right to where our water is falling in the middle of the canvas. And I'm doing this because while water normally looks brighter when it's falling because it's separated and more light can kind of work through it, here we're actually in an area that is directly opposite to where the light is facing, right? This area is facing us and it has this large rock in the way. We have these shadows being cast and that area is actually going to be significantly darker. It also creates something that's visually different from the rest of the water. So while it makes sense within the realm of our painting and our lighting scheme, it's also really great because it's breaking things up visually and adding an extra element that we didn't previously have. Here I'm also using that darker mixture over on the left hand side of the canvas to break up some areas that did become a little bit too opaque. I love acrylics because you know you can kind of overdo it and then walk it back five minutes later once it's dried. That's exactly what I'm doing here. And I always love to show these little fixes in these lessons to let you know that, you know, even when you've been doing this for 10, 15 years, you're still going to have those instances where you do want to play with it. With that though, I really like this color and we're going to do a lot more with it. So I take it, I add a lot of water to my brush. It's probably 80% water to 20% pigment right now. And I'm just adding this blue glaze on top of a lot of the highlighted water here in the foreground. And this is a wonderful way of interjecting additional color without kind of changing the values for the most part or your actual line work. It's essentially just painting with color, almost like watercolors. So really, really fun. I wanted more blue in the foreground because of course the foreground is going to have more saturated colors. And so I'm going over this area a couple of times. I want it as close to us as I can get it and then it dissipates as it gets farther and farther away, right? So, so far, really good. I like that a lot. Trying to get it to be fairly consistent. We definitely also need to start working it more so into the middle of the canvas as you can see right here. And I think that it makes a really, really big difference. But with that said, I think when you kind of step back, you can see the greater movements in the water. And that is so, so important. So remember to take those steps back and just ensure that you are getting that really wide view for this sort of thing. With that said, we are getting fairly, I don't know, late into the lesson. And I say this in every lesson and I, I make a note of it because it's important and it's something that I always wanna do. I wanna say a big thank you to you. I wanna say a big thank you to everybody who's still watching the lesson, to everybody who is still invested in a traditional art, who wants to you know, keep this medium alive and continue to create in such a digital age. I mean, you're watching a, a lesson on the computer, right? So. You know, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, being a part of the channel, being a part of the community, making this happen. I also want to say a big thank you to everybody who's up over on Patreon who literally makes these lessons happen. If it wasn't for you, in no world could I spend the amount of time on these lessons that I do. And I hope that you really enjoy things like the traceables and the reference photos that we have here for lessons like this, which are admittedly a bit more complicated. If you are new to the channel up over on Patreon, you can get those uh, things that do help with the painting process, but you can also get things like my eBooks, acrylics for beginners in it. We essentially learn the essentials, everything you need to know about acrylic painting. We have a bunch of eBooks full of traceables. We get access to our exclusive art Facebook group where I'll kind of share our artwork, which is great because we're working on fairly similar pieces for the most part. We can kind of learn a lot from each other and grab those ideas. But again, 
thank you for being here. Thank you for being up over on Patreon. Thank you for, you know, even if you can't support the channel up over on Patreon financially, I just appreciate that you're a part of the community and that you're taking the time to paint here with us. I figured I'd talk about that right now because we're essentially in a stage um, with the water specifically where we're doing a lot of touch-ups and I didn't want to just cut all of this footage. I wanted to show it to you, but I also figured it wasn't best to show it to you over like half an hour talking about things over and over again. So, you know, just a little section to say thank you for supporting the channel however you do, and I very much appreciate that you're here. Now, we just covered a glazing in the water, so we're now going to start glazing in the rocks. And I'm going to do so with some of our gold green, a little bit of our burnt umber to make it nice and earthy, a tiny bit of titanium white to build up that value to the point where it'll be similar to that of our moss. And then I'm also adding in some Mars black because I don't want it to be too, too saturated. That said, I am heading in to some of the kind of darker areas initially in the greens, areas that kind of look very visually a little bit repetitive because this is going to give us an added color and break up that repetition, right? It's going to make it interesting in a different way. Here, I'm probably using about 90% water on my brush to 10% actual paint. That way it is incredibly thin and we aren't disrupting any of the actual movements or line work here in the rocks. It's really just embellishing it and making it more interesting and providing it with an opportunity to stand out in a different way while still staying Stut a little bit subtle. Um, I know that might sound a little contradictory, but you are simultaneously attempting to achieve all of those different things, uh, especially kind of this late in the painting process. So here, yet again, I'm mixing up a bit of a brighter green, have that titanium white, a little bit of our cadmium yellow deep hue, our golden green, and I'm just mixing that up. So now I can head over to the left-hand side and continue some of these blades of grass. We painted these for the most part before we actually painted our water, so we had to cover up different portions of them and I just want to make sure that this is in fact extending on top of the water as it'll make it look significantly more realistic and three-dimensional. So for the most part, I'm finding previously applied applications, different pieces of grass, and I'm extending them to be a bit longer. That may mean kind of going over the entirety of them or areas uh, kind of in a cluster if you feel like those colors aren't all kind of congealing together the way that you want them to, but it's great to just go back in and add those extra layers. Really a lot of fun. I'm also going to add a plant down here in the bottom left hand side and I'm going to start by creating some very small little leaves. These are going to be the entirety of the leaves. We are quite close to us. We're not working with the implication of them. We are very much all in on the process right here. So I am trying to make sure that all of my applications are very sharp. I am using the smaller round pointed brush to do so. And I'm going in with that technique of very minimal amount of pressure initially so that I get a very sharp tip and then I apply additional pressure as I do a little bit of a drag to build out that body and then I relieve pressure at the end so that I can hopefully end with again another little sharp tip. And I'm also going in with a couple of different variations of color. They are getting darker as well, especially as I get towards the back of it. And now I'm going in with a brighter mixture. This again, very similar to the highlights that we've used in our grass, on our moss, all of that, and I'm going to start creating some brighter leaves in here as well. I'll start with the areas that I know that I want to pop. This may mean areas that I've left out because I simply didn't want to um, uh, kind of put anything there knowing that I had something that I wanted, but I'm also going over previously applied leaves that I feel like could just pop more. And in those scenarios, sometimes I don't cover the entirety of the leaf, so you can kind of see a little bit of that darker color along the edge. It gives it a bit of a three-dimensional effect, and I really like how that ends up looking. So here, yet again, just a bit of a wider look so you can see what it looks like from a bit of a distance. I'm continuously adding more to this, and I did find that the more I added, the more natural it it looked just to make sure that it doesn't stand out too much in contrast with everything else. We're adding this here to, you know, give the painting a different subject, a different element, 
but not take away from everything else. Here I'm also just going to use a little bit of burnt umber, titanium white, and Mars black to create some little branches to connect things. I wanted to do this after because I wanted my focus to be on the petals. It's not normally how you go about it, but you can always add more petals on top of it if you feel like they become a little bit distracting. But with that, I'm really happy with how this turned out and the branches acted as great leading lines moving the eye into the painting. Now, the final step here is actually going to be touch-ups, and this is something that's going to vary from person to person. We all have our strengths and weaknesses. We're all going to want to go back and change varying elements. However, I wanted to share this with you because I'm doing a couple of very specific things. The first is adding additional foliage up towards the tops of our trees. This is something that generally at the end of the painting, you are either going to want to make slightly brighter or you're going to want to add very small little leaves that kind of come off in different directions. Perhaps they are falling and floating in the wind. Perhaps the branches are just so small at that distance that you don't really see them. And I'm intentionally painting this from a real distance because I didn't want to kind of go back and add too much detail. I wanted it to look natural with everything else. And that's very much how I'd recommend doing touch-ups. This is where you bring the piece together and and just kind of focus on connection. So that's what I'm doing with these very careful, subtle taps with the smaller round pointed brush. And again, these are probably slightly brighter than the top highlights in there. And it's a nice balance between the color of the sky and the color of the, or not the color, but rather the value of the sky, right? How light and dark it is and the value of the actual leaves. But I really like how that ended up turning out out. And while I do this again, I'd like to say a big thank you for being here today. It is such a pleasure to work on these painting lessons. I love how this one turned out. I don't think I've done a piece with foliage like this and really maybe a year on the channel. So very happy to get back to it. We definitely incorporated some different steps. And I want you to think about the steps that we've learned throughout this process because there really were a lot. We started with the foliage and we did three different brushes, right? We started with that very basic layer with the filbert brush, and then we added that texture with the flat-headed brush, and then we added the highlights with the fan brush, and then, you know, we actually do have a fourth step. We went in with the smaller round pointed brush or the liner brush, and we added individual little leaves in the foreground. So lots of different ways to render a singular subject and generally combining different techniques and brushes is going to bring you to the best results. Here I'm heading up to the trees in the foreground and now I'm incorporating some additional applications there as well. Just trying to get those general movements and some distinct areas that are going to look very natural. Again, you want overlap in this area. You want some areas to look a little bit messy just because, you know, organically that's how it's going to be. You want opening in the leaves and there are just so many little things that all come together to make this a very natural piece but I just I loved working on this here today and I definitely think we should do more pieces like this in the future I have a I have a cherry tree idea that, I don't know, I, I think I'll probably wait till spring to work on that one just because it's more seasonally appropriate but I'm really excited I, I think that through this process, we've kind of opened some doors. I do have a lot of seascapes planned as well. So the future of the channel, I think is very exciting. We, um, we have some pretty cool projects. And again, I'd like to thank you for just being here and being a part of the creative journey. I hope that this inspires you. I hope that you feel like you've we kind of retained and you know picked up some really cool ideas and that you feel confident ready to go out and create your own marvelous piece as well so you know thank you for being here for you know uh, for being a part of this <laughs> i'm uh starting to trip on my words but hopefully we're ending on um something a little more friendly something a little less professional and hopefully you just you know that i care and and i appreciate you so thank you for being here. Thank you again to everybody who is up on Patreon, really supporting the channel directly. And again, for anybody who's new here, perhaps this is your first lesson and you made it two hours in listening to me talk about painting. If you did, 
good for you. Um, but also, uh, you know, you can support the channel up over on Patreon. There's a link in the description. And up there you can get all of my ebooks full of traceables. Also talking about glazing, composition, what brushes to use, uh, how much water to use, you know, just how to mix colors, really everything you need to know. We do have the exclusive Facebook group, which you can be a part of. Um, and we have the, the trace of words and the reference photos to just kind of help make things easy. I think I just talked about this in the lesson. I sometimes record at different steps at different times. Uh, you know, if I kind of have like a free half hour, I'll try to record step A and B, despite the fact that these steps are, you know, maybe five minutes. I, I try to do them three or four times each. That way they are as informative as they can be because often I find I'll record one and I'm like oh you know but I could have could have included that information as well you know what I'll go back and I'll, I'll redo it and I'll do that three or four times um which again is I probably why at the end of these lessons I am so thankful to the people up over on patreon because they give me the opportunity to take the time to make the lessons really how I want them to be, to be something I feel that is quality and that will teach you as much as you, you can. So rather than just kind of in a hurried manner recording it once, I, I can, um, you know, sometimes do it four or five times. Definitely did that with another, a number of clips in here. But again, I wanted this last one to be a bit more raw, just so it, we end things on a very personable note because we just went through a journey together. And again, I just Hope you're very excited about your piece yet to come and really excited about where we're going to make on the channel. So I will see you soon with another lesson that was chosen up over on one of the Patreon polls. And um, yeah, I will see you next Saturday. So stay creative and take care.